Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report, my weekly report actually running now for August 11th, 2018. And this week I'm going to talk about one particular subject for about 90% of the report. Uh, Navy Thomas 8 sent me in an article from Fox News, which actually the original article came from The Sun, and uh, Fox News basically just copied the article and published it. But it's about the Bermuda Triangle and the supposed mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. And the title to this article is, well, and the, I'll give you both the titles. The uh, Fox News title is Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved, Scientists Claim. And then in the Sun Times, the, the, not Sun Times, but the Sun version, uh, which is UK uh, press, Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved as British experts claim boats were sunk by monster 100-foot roadways created by three storms coming together. And they claim... Uh, British scientists, but the only real reference you can actually see here is a uh, well-known science presenter called Dr. Simon Boxall, who uh, he's uh, pretty well-known. He's had uh, 100 docu over 100 documentaries and about a thousand different interviews on different shows, I think including he's probably even been on Coast to Coast AM too. So he's more of a science presenter, although he is an actual uh, qualified oceanographer, so he does have credentials behind it, and he's also um, teaches at a uh, well, I don't, I don't know if he directly teaches, but he does uh, teaching materials, it says, for a uh, UK uh, university. But anyway, what I wanted to talk about basically was uh, this theory of his about the rogue waves. First off, um, let me talk about what rogue waves are. They can happen anywhere in the ocean. I guess most of them tend to happen off the southeast coast of Africa. And a lot of times when different uh, conditions come together, different wind conditions and storm conditions and uh, currents and stuff like that kind of, uh, happen just in the right way. They can uh, add these waves heights together uh, to make a wave up to about 100 foot tall easily. Uh, it's, it doesn't happen real often, but in theory you can even have, and I've heard this talked about too, even if you have an ocean that doesn't have any storms happening or anything like that, just because of the fact of how waves work. Uh, when they cross each other, if you got waves coming from different directions, they can either reinforce each other, they can actually knock each other down. It's called destructive interference. The other is called constructive interference. And basically, on average, they do about as much destructive as constructive interference, so you don't get a lot of dramatic changes in wave heights. But you could theoretically have waves come together in such a way to where the ocean could all of a sudden become, in one small area, a lot calmer because they do a lot of destructive interference. And you could have them come together to where they did a lot of constructive interference. And all of a sudden, even though your average wave height is 10 foot, you could all of a sudden see a 40, 50 foot wave, uh, theoretically. Now, this wouldn't happen very often. And the taller the wave, the less likely it would happen. It might be that 100 foot waves, when you don't have a specific clause like a storm or something like that, they might happen you know, only once every several years. I don't know. They haven't seen enough of them. But uh, satellites have captured them uh, way out in the middle of the ocean, just sometimes when there wasn't a real clear explanation. So that's the way rogue waves tend to work. But let me get back to this article and the Bermuda Triangle. In my opinion, the Bermuda Triangle is not a mystery at all. If you actually examine it using scientific evidence, and for the area it is, uh, the type of weather that has and the amount of traffic it has, both air traffic and ship traffic, it does not seem to be any different than any other area and the amount of mysterious, and, and a lot of these I wouldn't even call mysterious disappearances because the problem is a lot of the authors that write these books don't bother to do the research. They more or less just repeat what other authors have told them. So you get a lot of cases to where things are called a mystery, whereas they have actually been solved. People have investigated and actually solved them. They also have uh, misrepresented weather reports at the time and said things like, well, uh, weather reports were totally calm when this happened, and if you go back and investigate, the weather was not exactly that calm. It was stormy, and it's not unusual at all for ships and airplanes to have problems in storms. I actually saw one scientist come on, too, and he did a survey of various points around the Earth, and he said you could actually make oval areas in a lot of different places. I think there was over a dozen different places he drew these oval patterns um, where there was high traffic areas and the right kind of conditions to where you would have an out of the ordinary number of disappearances of planes and ships and stuff like that. Um, out of ordinary compared to average, but not out of ordinary compared to what you would expect for that amount of traffic and the Bermuda Triangle isn't any different. And I would like to point you to, I'll give a reference to this too, an author called Larry Kush, The Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved and he actually uses science to go in and talk about it and talk about the misrepresentations, uh, whether purposeful or not. 
And also the fact, too, I always, with a grain of salt, when you see headlines like scientists and they only list one guy and he ends up being more a science presenter. And don't get me wrong, I don't put down science presenter. And even in the case of Dr. Simon Boxall, uh, we need science presenters and we need even more of them. But you've got to realize he isn't going to get people to watch documentaries and to interview him on news shows saying that everything's just average with the Bermuda Triangle for what you would expect. You're not going to get people to really follow. You're not going to get people to buy the books. You're not going to get people. I mean, everybody knows, especially if you're a university professor like he happens to be also, your career basically and your uh, popularity hinges on putting out as much, much material to the public as possible, producing as many papers as possible, and hopefully getting interviews and getting, you know, um, on shows and stuff like that. So he does have a kind of way, you know, the way he presents himself is to do something like that to be able to keep his name in the news. So I kind of tend to take those things with a little bit more skepticism than normal. So in case you want to investigate, I will have links to all this stuff. And, and the book, too, if you want to get it, I, I would urge you can go and get it to the library. This book has been out since 1975, the uh, book by Larry Cush. Uh, you can get it, actually. I just looked on Amazon right now, and you can get paperback versions of it used for $2. You can even get the hardcover book for $2.95. So it's not a real expensive book to you to uh, get. And if you're in a hurry, I think one of the free shipping offers, if you pay 5 bucks, I think you can get it within two days if you're in a hurry to get it. So, And next, let me look through my notes here. I made some notes here, too, to make sure I didn't. Uh, oh, uh, Navy Thomas also, uh, Navy Thomas 8 also sent me, Tom H., uh, an update on the NASA Parker Solar Probe. I talked about that in my last TDD report about the solar probe and how they protected it from the heat and how they're going to let it actually fly through the corona eventually. That's going to come a few years after it actually reaches the sun that it's going to fly through the corona and how they're able to protect it with the heat shielding. Well, this NASA video that you're going to see here, or the video about the NASA solar probe, is going to tell you about the different maneuvers they had to use to get it to go into sun's orbit, how they're going to use it. Um, they're going to use Venus to actually slow it down so that it doesn't overshoot the sun. Now, they kind of at the end of the video, if you watch this video, they're going to say it fly past, when it flies past the sun. Well, it's not going to actually fly past the sun in the sense it's going to fly on past the sun and not come back. It's going to eventually get into a high orbit around the sun and then slowly over time decrease the orbit until it actually enters the corona. And hopefully if they designed it and engineered it right, it's going to survive its passage through the corona and give us a lot of new and great information about how the sun works. Maybe make it more predictable for astronauts that are either on the moon or Mars. In the case of a coronal mass ejection, that can be very dangerous unless you have a warning of a day or two ahead of time to where you can, or at least, you know, you want about five or five or six hours to be able to seek shelter. So hopefully this will give them the information they need. And also I wanted to talk about, I was going to talk about it in the last TDD report because this was, um, has been out for quite a few weeks, but uh, from americaspace.com, if you're going to go there, you can see that they've done the third test on the Blue Origin capsule, one of the capsules that's going to uh, bring our astronauts, starting 2019, going to bring our astronauts up to the International Space Station instead of renting taxi rides on the Russian uh, spaceships. We're going to actually be doing it ourselves. The other one is the Boeing one. Um, so between those two, I think starting the first Schedule 1 test flight is going to be in April, and they hope by the middle of 2019 to start actually lifting astronauts. There also, there already, uh, there's also um, already American uh, spacecraft doing cargo runs up to the space station, but they want to make sure this is uh, the, the tests of this. And the, the special test about this is the ejection system for the crew capsule uh, for safety. If you've seen the Challenger explosion, if you've seen the Columbia space, uh, uh, the Columbia break apart in the uh, atmosphere, you know how uh, it really hurts the space program a lot to uh, lose astronauts and you want to try any way you can. Well, this new system supposedly from the very launch to up to 200,000, 300,000 feet until it reaches its separation point. Any time between the launch and the separation point, they can actually abort the launch and safely parachute back down to Earth. And this is the third test that they run, and all three tests have come out. Okay, this last one, I think they um, tested it out at above 200,000 feet. I think even it's been tested up to 300,000 feet. So it works perfect in all cases. So we should have no more cases except if something really extremely goes wrong, we should have the opportunity to save our astronauts. These capsules, I think, are built to carry three at a time. So you will no longer be risking lives, at least to the extent we were before, and we'll be able to uh, actually do something about it if we have a malfunction or something and, and uh, rescue the crew. 
So that's about it. I will uh, talk to you guys in another two weeks. I'm doing the TDD reports the second Saturday and the fourth Saturday of the month. So uh, I will catch you guys in about two weeks.